Hello, I'm Andrew, here with Sean today. Hey. We're gonna be making a bunch of mochi as well as several recipes utilizing that mochi. This is part of an ongoing series on the channel where it's usually just me making a bunch of one ingredient, usually doing recipes I've never tried before, not always getting it exactly right. But I found there's something very fun and interesting about experiencing the same ingredient over and over again that can teach you a lot about how it works and what is truly great about that ingredient. Today we're doing mochi largely at your suggestion. I really only grew up knowing it as sort of this like flavorless, gluey mass. But a lot of people also know it as like mochi ice cream. I think that's probably the application that most people think of. Really just wanted to experiment with a bunch of those methods. So we've already made all these recipes. Now we're gonna take you through how those experiences went. Rie from the channel was also interested in doing some mochi exploration. So she'll be making some recipes as well. Yeah. So the first thing we made was the mochi itself which I've actually done previously in a tasty video where we did it sort of the traditional mallet and giant mortar type of operation. This time we used your family's personal mochi making appliance. I grew up with this appliance from like the late 70s, like the 80s, it's made by National. It's this mochi machine we haven't used in like 20 years. So I pulled it out of storage. I was a little worried yeah. it was gonna fall apart on us. I was amazed. I think appliances of this vintage can be so well made. It's such a sturdy thing. It looks kind of like a Star Wars droid. <laughs> we started by soaking the rice for the mochi. Mm -hmm. So you have to yeah. soak that overnight and it's particular rice, right? Yeah, so this type of rice, it's known as mochi gome in Japan. When you cook this up, it's going to become really sticky, starchy, and a little sweet. So we soak it overnight, drain that, and then simply load it into this machine. So the machine has two settings. So the first setting is going to be the steam settings. It goes for like 30 minutes and then it yeah. makes this incredible buzzing noise. You take the lid off and then you set it to knead. And all that's doing the action is this tiny rotating component. The rice starts to become like smoother and smoother and smoother because it's getting broken down. And as it's going, you're watching for it to not get too dry. So I was adding a little bit of water, which you would actually do if you were doing the traditional method. So the machine comes with this incredible piece of plastic. <laughs> called the remover, but it's basically a reverse funnel where you slowly push it down on top of it in one swift motion, pull it out, get it onto a mochiko covered surface. Yeah, it is the closest thing to edible lava, I think, as right. you can get right. without yeah. actually hurting yourself. Yeah, good selling point for mochi. <laughs> um, the most like traditional sort of way to prepare it is you wet your hands and then you immediately start pinching off these little balls from the mochi, and then you get into a ball, and then you're, you're good to go. You're struggling between a point where it's literally too hot and will burn your hands, and it gets too cool, and you won't be able to right. work with it anymore. So we're basically portioning this out into various sizes and shapes, either for consuming immediately or for our later recipes. Yeah. But the first thing we made was what? A red bean daifuku, kind of like a stuffed mochi of sorts. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you do is you take a little bit of mochi, and then you flatten it. And then you take a ball of koshian, like smooth red bean, put that in the middle and you wrap the mochi around. Which it seems like it'll be very easy to do because the mochi is very pliable and stretchable, yes. but it doesn't want to stretch evenly. So you end up with a lot of thin spots or most of your mochi around the back of the ball of red bean. Right, but we, we got at least one to be really good. And then we also roll that in a little bit of the soybean powder. Yes, yeah, so you just kind of dip it in some of the red bean and it gives it like a nutty, sweet exterior. Probably the simplest way we tried it was a little bit of soy sauce and sugar mixed together and then the mochi simply dipped into that. Delicious. Growing up when we made it, I feel like the mochi was always still really molten and gluey when we would eat it. Yeah. But this batch, it had a really good bite but it was still chewy and, and loose, but it, it held its like consistency really, really, really nicely. I think this is the best batch of mochi I've had. Really? In a homemade environment. It was tasty. It was great. The next recipe we made were mochi crunch cookies. We decided to make a batch of cookies using this mochi crunch, and we referenced a recipe from the Hawaii Homestyle Cooking blog, Keeping It Rel. What we did first was we had to make this yeah. okaki or mochi crunch. The, the recipe suggests yeah. store-bought, but we wanted to go through this process since we had the mochi to see that transformation take place. We thought it would be pretty cool. So we had our mochi from our mochi making day. We tried two methods. The first was fried it simply in a pan of shallow hot oil, dropping them in. We found that slicing them as thinly as possible would 
make them puff up better. These were actually really right. tasty on yeah. their own. I mean, of all the things we made, this was one of the single best bites for me. Like the outside is really kind of hard and crunchy, but the inside gets a little bit almost honeycomb-ish. Yeah, almost like a, like a meringue. Yeah. Like in a pavlova, yeah. the way you get that almost marshmallow, almost honeycomb mm -hmm. type of texture. The other method we tried was baking it in the oven. I was surprised ha at how easily it worked. They puffed up and actually got a much harder texture. The next step was to season the crackers. So we had a mixture of soy sauce and sugar. With the fried variety, we tossed them in a big bowl which I think might've been a little bit of a mistake because I think some of the pieces got too saturated. We then put those in an oven to dehydrate, but because they were so saturated, they I think stayed in there a little bit too long and developed an almost overcooked soy yeah. sauce flavor. With our baked variant, we just simply basted them with that soy sauce and sugar mixture, which came out really well, but was definitely a much subtler flavor. For the context of our cookie, we decided to go with the fried variety. Just because the flavor was a little bit more assertive in the context of something sweet, we thought it would make more sense. So then it was just a matter of making the batter. We actually had Inca join us and help us for this stage of the recipe. Made a simple batter, roughly chopped yeah. our fried rice crackers, mixed that into the batter, scooped it, baked it off. Yeah, it was a delicious cookie. Delicious. Had sort of that salted caramel aspect to it with Love the it. sweet and savory. The next recipe we made were pan-fried, sesame-coated, red bean and black sesame stuffed mochi. And for this recipe, we actually did not use our mochi from the mochi making day. We used a different variety of mochi. Uh, we took the shiratamaku, which is where they make a rice paste using glutinous rice, and then they dry that and break it into small pieces. Mixed it with sugar and water, and then microwaved it. And microwaving feels like it shouldn't be a step, but sure enough, here it is. Because the shiratamaku is basically dehydrated rice paste, you're basically just rehydrating it and adding sweetness. So it rehydrates really beautifully into this translucent, delicate version of the mochi that we made on the first day. Yeah. And so it's really easy to work with. You use it for a lot of mochi desserts. Like when we made the red bean thing on the first day, you would often use shiratamaku for that. Mm -hmm. We portioned them into little rounds. Yep. We then had our filling, which is a mixture of red bean paste and black sesame. Mm -hmm. Also portioned little balls of that filling then took our mochi, wrapped it around that as easily as we could. Yep. Even though we were working with the easier version, we still experienced quite a lot of difficulty in forming them. In the context of this recipe, that was not hypercritical. We then took yeah. those completed balls, flattened them, and then coated them in sesame, and then lightly pan fried them until the exterior got a nice dark roasted color. I don't think it's supposed to look like how it turned out, but it tasted great. The texture was perfect. And then the mix of red bean and black sesame really went well. The mochi itself was too sugary. Yeah, it, it actually didn't need the sugar yeah, perhaps, right? right? Like it was not essential to its texture or constitution. I think the next time I do it, I would use less or, or no sugar, but it, it was still a great recipe. I would 100% make these again. So next we have a few recipes from Rie. She was also excited to experiment with mochi and share some recipes of her own. Hi, I'm Rie. Growing up in Japan, I ate mochi a lot. Andrew and Sean made mochi from scratch, but I'm going to use store mochi like this. It is pre-packaged individually like this, and it has a long shelf life. The first recipe is new variation of kinako mochi. Kinako mochi is very traditional kind of treats. So usually mochi is cooked in a boiling water, Water, but for this recipe, it is cooked very differently. So first, you heat up non-stick pan very, very hot. You press against mochi in, onto the hot pan and they will leave marks and you kind of scrape it and eat it. It kind of reminded me of rolled ice cream because you kind of like scrape very thin substance. <laughs> I ended up only using half mochi and um, used the leftover for my next recipe. But I uh, was able to make one plate full of kind of like a shaved mochi. Once you make a plate full, you sprinkle with soybean powder, kinako. They used Japanese molasses called kromitsu, 
but I couldn't find it at the Japanese grocery store so I ended up using maple syrup. I love mochi because of the texture. It's chewy texture. It was a little bit soft. To be honest, I like regular kinako mochi to compare with this like new generation kinako mochi. The next recipe is mochi French toast. I also saw it on Tasty Japan's page. It looked so good, so I'm super excited to try this recipe. I cut mochi into small cubes, put them in a microwave safe bowl and soak with milk, cook in the microwave. One minute interval for four minutes. Mochi starts getting softer, so I use rubber spatula and uh, press against the bowl and make sure everything is well combined. Mochi and the milk melted together and I added sugar and egg. The texture of the butter is almost like a cake butter. Cook covered about four minutes. I started cooking like medium heat. When the butter is cooked, I uh, fold it up like an omelette and sprinkle some powdered sugar. And this was so delicious. It was like very chewy. Also, mochi is naturally gluten-free. So it is a great gluten-free option for some like sweet breakfast. Two thumbs up. The last recipe is ozoni. Ozoni is a mochi soup. Each prefecture has different recipes. I grown up eating my mom's ozoni made with dashi using roasted eel bone topped with uh, grilled eel as well. It is one of my favorite dish. I live in LA and I couldn't find any grilled eel. Instead, I used the chicken. I'm going to prep ingredients first and I cut them into little like flower shape. Totally just like decorative purpose only. So if you don't have that, you can just cut whatever shape you want. Um, boiling salty water and blanch spinach very briefly and next I made dashi I used awase dashi which is using dried kombu, kombu is kelp add katsuobushi, cook for 2-3 to three minutes in gentle heat strain them, bring it to a boil I put chicken first and once chicken is cooked I add carrot and daikon make sure to skim well because you want to have a nice clear broth at the end. I seasoned soup with sake, mirin, and soy sauce. I toasted my mochi in a toaster oven. I think this is the perfect mochi dish for cold winter days. The next thing we made was also an ozoni. Yeah, I don't know why we let ourselves follow Rie. The one that we referenced for this recipe was a Kansai style uh, ozoni from Just One Cookbook. Kansai is like Kyoto, Osaka, it's kind of that, that area. This one is actually entirely vegetarian, okay. which I thought was really interesting. This one you're using daikon, you're using a really hearty satoimo, which is like a taro, mm. basically. And then you're also chopping up carrots and then punching them into these cute little flowers. Meanwhile, what we did was we made a kombu dashi or a kombu broth. So let the vegetables finish cooking until they were like perfectly tender. Turn off the heat and you add this miso. I've never worked with this miso before. It's a white miso. It's a little bit sweeter. We had our leftover mochi that we brought back to temperature in a small pot of water. Basically, you end up with this really hearty soup with mochi at the bottom of it. And then a couple of other garnishes. We had yuzu that we took a peel of and made julienne of the zest. It was really Really fragrant and I think it really brought a lot. It was next to a mitsuba. It's like a Japanese parsley. I think it tastes like celery. Even though I've never eaten this, it tasted like cedar wood to me. So this was the one recipe we made where I was reminded that I don't always love mochi. Mm. Um, it just in the broth became very gummy to me. I felt the complete opposite. I really enjoyed eating the mochi this way. Being able to stretch it create different bites, I thought it was great. The last thing we made was simply grilled mochi. So this was utilizing the mochi that we made on our first day, but grilling it to become a toasty, delicious treat. What my mom will do is she'll keep it in the freezer and then pull it out 
over the course of months and then throw it into the toaster oven and it'll just like get crispy and puffy and... You were at the Japanese grocery store and found this contraption for assisting in the grilling of mochi in a home context. So I found this like tiny square grill and it's literally just for grilling mochi on. So this day was also a bit of an experiment for us. All we were hoping to achieve was to make some crispy, delicious mochi and flavor it in a variety of ways. So we had some of our sort of full-sized rounds of mochi. Mm -hmm. We also had some smaller ones that we put on skewers. It actually worked a lot better than I expected it would. Mm -hmm. I was expecting this to be a total gimmick and to turn into basically a fire hazard type of mess because I was sure that it would just drip down and burn. Yeah. And sure enough, our first mochi did burn a little bit, but we quickly realized the technique to it, which was to rotate it consistently until the exterior would dry enough, mm -hmm. where then it could stand up to the heat without dripping for longer bouts of time, and then develop a nice toasted char on the outside. It's, to me, the best way to eat mochi. We did some experiments where we basted the mochi with that soy sauce and sugar mixture, and then re-grilled that. That was also very good. Yeah. And as somebody who definitely experienced mochi for the first time as mochi ice cream that wasn't very good somewhere, <laughs> I, I'm just blown away by this preparation of mochi. It is so delicious. It has that savory and sweet component. Yeah. It has that toasted rice flavor, which is so, so good. But I think as a crust to a sort of molten-y thing, it is perhaps its like best version of itself. We like tried breaking it open and it just gave this like cheese bowl. Mochi's bowl. Mochi's bowl. Mochi's bowl. Well, that's how we cooked a bunch of mochi. I hope you enjoyed. I certainly learned a lot. Thank you for bringing me along on your journey. Thank you to Rie for joining us on this video as well. If you have any other suggestions for ingredients we should make a lot of in the future, we'd love to hear them. Thank you for watching.